today we will have three public health scholars that will be contributing their knowledge and their expertise to our symposium. And we, also, we will also have a graduate student here at NMSU, um, Ms. Ida Martin, that will be contributing her research. Our first presenter today is Dr. Rebecca Palacios. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at New Mexico State University. Her research focuses on culturally tailoring cancer education for Hispanic cancer survivors, largely under the support of the NIH U54 NMSU Fred Hodge Partnership for the Advancement of Cancer Research. After assessing the needs and communication patterns of Hispanic mothers diagnosed with cancer and their school aged children, her team culturally adapted an evidence based cancer parenting education program which counsels child rearing mothers with cancer on communication and parenting strategies. Dr. Palacios is currently leading a randomized clinical trial testing the efficacy of the culturally adapted Conexiones program. During the clinical trial, Dr. Palacios' team also assessed the impact of the pandemic on young Latina mothers diagnosed with cancer. The title of her presentation today is Impact of COVID-19 on Latina mothers diagnosed with cancer in the El Paso del Norte region. Peggy? Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Okay, so so thank you for that introduction. Um, so as Dr. Diaz says, I'm going to be presenting on the impact of COVID-19 on Latino mothers diagnosed with cancer, specifically in the north of the uh, the North border region. Before I go into the impact of the pandemic on uh, Hispanic cancer survivors, I want to talk first about the impact of cancer uh, on a Hispanic individual. And my focus will largely be on young Latina mothers, which is who we've been working with over the last several years. And so um, there are several challenges that Hispanic women experience in managing their cancer. Uh, there are cultural factors such as familism, which sometimes uh, uh, contributes to delay in cancer care seeking. There are systemic barriers such as insurance status and uh, ability to access care, and also communication and language barriers when interacting with providers. There's persistent medical concerns following a cancer diagnosis, such as the fear of cancer progressing or returning once it's been cleared. Of course, there's various economic issues um, related to cancer, such as the cost of the treatment itself, whether one will lose their job due to the debilitating effects of the cancer or the cancer treatment, and then worrying about the impact on the family's welfare as well, because uh, cancer is an expensive disease. Um, also, uh, it leads to relationship concerns and also has a psychosocial impact on Hispanic women diagnosed with cancer, including contributing to negative body image, sense of uh, loss of womanhood and um, negative influences on one's sexual health. So the research, uh, there's not a lot of research on Hispanic cancer survivors, uh, but the research that does exist uh, finds that Hispanic cancer survivors have poor outcomes overall. Um, one study by Culver found that early stage Hispanic breast cancer survivors reported more distress than either African American or, or non Hispanic white cancer survivors. Uh, they also found in a study by JAMS that lower acculturated Hispanic breast cancer survivors were more likely to report a decline in emotional well being compared to non Hispanic white survivors. And then about 45.6% of Hispanic breast cancer survivors reported depressive symptoms, so almost half. And this is, this is a large proportion. Um, other studies have found that in the general population of most of the research is on non-Hispanic white uh, breast cancer survivors, uh, they tended to report dep about 35 to 45 reported depressive symptoms. So already cancer is a, quite a burden, right? It has quite an impact. Um, there's particularly uh, unique challenges uh, following a cancer diagnosis to managing one's cancer on the U.S.-Mexico border region. So compared to the rest of the, 
the nation or the residents are more likely to experience uh, low socioeconomic status and lack of insurance, which can uh, delay treatment or um, prohibit it altogether. Uh, um, also on the border, we have limited cancer facilities or experts so that, uh, you know, you might not be able to get your specific type of cancer treated if you live in the border region. And you may have to travel great distances uh, to healthcare facilities to get the appropriate cancer treatment. So uh, there's not a lot of research on Hispanic mothers diagnosed with cancer, um, but we do know that an estimated 18% of all cancer survivors um, are parents of a minor child. And the majority of these are women and under the age of 50. So what we have learned, we've learned from non-Hispanic white uh, mothers diagnosed with cancer. And what they report is uh, substantial illness intrusive, uh, a cancer affecting their ability to care for their children, their ability to work and add to the household income. They talk about fears of recurrence and the potential impact of the cancer on their family, especially their children. And they also worry, they experience lots of worry and guilt regarding their children's future, especially should they die. So what about young Hispanic mothers, specifically those living in the US-Mexico border? Well, we did do some qualitative research and what we learned was that uh, following a cancer diagnosis, these mothers felt it was the most difficult time of their life. Um, they reported that the treatment for the disease was worse than the actual disease. Um, here you see some quotes, my world has already been taken by cancer because it was like, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't, you just can't. And then they also reported feeling alone, especially when they started to feel a little bit better, they felt like their family and friends tended to think they were okay and they would drop them. They also reported having to figure out how to live day by day and were especially challenged uh, by the mm -hmm. impact of cancer on their home life and their children specifically. They struggled how to talk to cancer about cancer with their children. And they also talked about needing lots of resources, including help to take care of their children when they needed to go out for a cancer treatment or procedure. So I just wanted to give you that little background just on the burden of cancer on the Hispanic cancer survivor. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit, not so much about the details of the clinical trial, but at the, the women we were working with during this clinical trial. So we were testing the efficacy of Conexiones, which is a culturally adapted cancer parenting education program for young Hispanic mothers diagnosed with cancer. And so the people that, the, the women that participated in our study were diagnosed Latina mothers. Uh, they ranged in age between 26 to 57 years and their mean, uh, their mean age was 41 years. Uh, about 34% had less than a high school or a high school diploma only. Um, some had a college, some college, others had, uh, were college graduates, about 44%. About half worked part-time or full-time. Um, about 47% had a household income less than 35,000. And for a family of four, that's living in poverty. Um, marital status, about half were married, half were not. Uh, regarding language, about a third preferred to speak Spanish. And then regarding the number of children in the household, the majority had one to two children in the household. Regarding disease characteristics, um, the moms, uh, the majority had breast cancer, but others had gynecological cancers and thyroid cancer. So these are the types of cancers that aren't easily treated here on the US-Mexico border. There are not as many specialists. So typically these patients have to travel out of town to get treatment and these others as well. The mothers varied in the stage of cancer that they're diagnosed. Hispanics tend to be diagnosed in later stages, as you can see here, um, about 77% were in stage two and three. And so here's the timeline of our, our clinical trial. So we started our clinical trial midway in 2019, and then we were impacted by the COVID pandemic in 2020, in early 2020. And the, the clin clinical trial continued through 2021, and we actually extended it a little bit. So we're still uh, trying to complete the clinical trial. Um, so regarding our baseline measures, uh, so 
The original clinical trial was measuring anxiety and depression using these two instruments. Those were primary outcomes in our study. And of course, we were worried that the pandemic was going to affect these outcomes. And so we added uh, an additional measure uh, called the COVID-19 impact of the pandemic and quality of life in cancer patients and survivors by Veneta et al. And it measured these things, including uh, COVID-specific anxiety and depression. And so what did we find? So regarding COVID-related anxiety, the MONS reported uh, high anxiety regarding the, the pandemic impacting their cancer care and recovery, impacting their family or possibly somebody in their family dying from COVID. They also talked about their own increased risk for um, contracting COVID because of their cancer, if they were already uh, susceptible to it, had a greater susceptibility to it. And then other parts of their lives were also affected by it. Regarding COVID specific depression. So because of COVID, the mom, about a third of the moms reported feeling negative and anxious about the future and just feeling overall sad and depressed. Regarding the impact of COVID on their healthcare, uh, about a third of the moms reported disruption in their general medical care and another 27% reported disruptions in their cancer-specific care, which is very distressing. Uh, regarding the ability, their satisfaction with the provider to protect them from COVID, uh, taking those necessary measures to address COVID-19 or providing adequate information on how to prevent COVID-19 or protect themselves, uh, a lot of them said they were pretty satisfied. Um, regarding financial hardships related to COVID, so about a third of the pop of our sample reported, you know, lots of anxiety around finances, uh, especially ability to maintain their health care, to take care of others financially, uh, losing their job because of COVID, and then also just general financial difficulties. About 20% uh, reported being unable to purchase basic necessities such as food. Regarding COVID-19 disruptions to daily activities, um, the majority uh, really talked about disruptions to social interactions with family and friends and also to their daily routines. But also look at this up here, difficulty taking care of their children's needs and balancing their needs, the needs of their children with their other responsibilities. So that became quite a juggling act for everybody. But these uh, diagnosed mothers, as particularly at the time when they would expect to be recovering from cancer when their children were away at school, now they're at home and also competing uh, against their recovery. So when looking at the overall relationships of COVID-specific anxiety and COVID-specific depression, we find that these were most closely uh, and, and significantly correlated with disruptions to daily activity resulting from the pandemic and also with the financial hardship. Um, regarding the, the relationship of these two measures to our other measures of depression and anxiety in the study, we didn't find significant correlations. Um, just in the those folks who were, well, in the overall general score. But then we did find a significant correlation of COVID-related anxiety and depression with clinical levels of depression on the CESD measure, which is a measure that is used in many, many studies to examine clinical levels of anxiety. So in summary, the diagnosed mothers uh, experienced greatest anxiety about how cancer would increase their risk for COVID infection death, how it would impact their cancer care and recovery. About a third of the mothers reported disruption in general or cancer care, as you can imagine how distressing that would be. And another third reported financial hardships related to COVID. About 40% reported COVID made it very difficult to take care of their children's needs. Also, 56% uh, uh, of the mothers reported or revealed clinical levels of depression and 5% revealed clinical levels of anxiety. COVID-related depression and anxiety were higher in diagnosed mothers experiencing high levels of COVID-related disruption in their daily activities and social interactions, and also those experiencing hardship. Finally, COVID-19 uh, related depression and anxiety were significantly correlated with clinical depression. 
So in conclusion, COVID-19 had a detrimental effect on the mental health of Latina mothers diagnosed with cancer, uh, an underserved clinical population. It also had a detrimental effect on clinical trials, uh, testing interventions, promoting psychosocial well-being of cancer survivors. So our recommendations are cancer survivors should be referred to mental health services, especially following catastrophic events like pandemics, and also clinical trials to try to control for the pandemic impact. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Palacios. This is a fascinating uh, piece of research, very relevant, very pertinent. Re let's, let me remind you that we will have 15 minutes at the end of all the presentations for questions and answers. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Jagdish Kupchandani. He's a professor of public health at New Mexico State University. He received a, a doctorate in clinical medicine from India, a master's in public health from Western Kentucky University and a PhD in health education and epidemiology from the University of Toledo. Within the past decade, he has mentored and taught over 500 students pursuing undergraduate and graduate degrees in public health, nursing, or medicine. During this time, he has also co-authored more than 150 research articles in prestigious journals, such as Lancet Journal of American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine, with emphasis on global health, social epidemiology, and injury and violence prevention. Most recently, his, re his research has received widespread attention from prominent media outlets such as Fox News, MSN, Bloom Bloomberg News, Chicago Tribune, WSJ, and Huffington Post. Dr. Kupchandani has also served as an elected director of the World Association of Medical Editors. And his presentation today is Tracking COVID-19 Vaccination Hesitancy, Worldwide Trends and Predictors. Dr. Kupchandani. Thank you, um, Dr. Diaz, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you can give me a signal that you can see my presentation and then I can start. Uh, can you all see this? Yes, we see it. We can see it. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Diaz and uh, all the organizers of the conference. Um, my talk today looks at COVID vaccine hesitancy, <clears throat> but before uh, I jump into that, I, I think the new trend of talking about vaccine hesitancy is actually not new. The first vaccines were approved in 1796. So we have 200 years of history of vaccine hesitancy. In 2019, before the pandemic, the World Health Organization said vaccine hesitancy could be the top global health security threat uh, that we will face in the near future. Uh, and there was no anticipation of a pandemic coming up, but we still discussed this. I, I wrote about it extensively for a bunch of media outlets on how we are reversing all the gains that we have made from the vaccines. So as soon as we hit the pandemic, uh, I'm sorry for the cluttered slide, but in June, 2020, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we designed a questionnaire anticipating a vaccine and thought about what will people uh, think of the vaccine when it comes out in a short period of time. So in June 2020, we sent out a questionnaire to a national random sample of 1,878 people. Uh, and the study was widely covered in the media, possibly the first of its kind in the United States. And essentially in this study, we use Amazon MTurk, social media, uh, Facebook, community networks, emails, uh, and we finally were able to achieve a response rate of 1878 in individuals from 50 states. Um, note that this is a pre-vaccine study, and we needed 1,300 people to make a good judgment of what will be the acceptance rate of a vaccine when it comes out. Uh, and 22% um, people said, no, I don't want any vaccine for COVID-19, even if it was to be free, available to me. Um, I hope you can hold on to this number 22%. This was June 2020 before the vaccine came out. 78% people said, yes, I'll, I'm willing to take the vaccine or I'm likely to take the vaccine. Then we dived into what was it that was causing people not to accept a vaccine if it was available. Overall, 22% people said, no, I don't want the vaccine uh, before the vaccines came out. Among those 34%, among African-Americans and 29% Hispanics said, I don't want the vaccine. 
compared to other groups of individuals. So before the vaccines were rolled out, racial minorities of some groups were hesitant to take the vaccine. Then we asked people about their age and based on age, those who were 40 to 60 years old were the most hesitant to take the vaccine even before they came out. Uh, the rest of them almost had equal chances of taking the vaccine. Older people were the most eager to take a vaccine even before the vaccine came out, possibly because in summer 2020, they were the ones who were facing the highest death rates and they saw the vaccine probably as a measure to save their life. Then we asked people about their education. Uh, those who had less than high school education, 31% compared to the national average of 22% would not take the vaccine. And even those without college education, 26% did not want to take the vaccine. So we found you know, some middle-aged adults um, with lower education, racial minorities were not willing to take the vaccine. In terms of marriage, those who are single, never married, uh, were the least likely to accept a vaccine, possibly younger. <coughs> Having a child at home was found to be a predictor in our first national study. Those who had children at home did not know if the vaccine would kill them or if they fell sick who would take care of the child. So generally they were more hesitant to take the vaccine, 25% compared to 22% national average. And then finally we asked them about their location. Rural Americans were the most hesitant, 29% versus 22% urban Americans who denied taking a vaccine before the vaccine came out. In relation to income, those who had the lowest income, uh, less than 60,000, less than the US median household income were the most hesitant. 28% people, 26% versus 22% national average. So clearly there is a gap here uh, with low income, low education, racial minority, and some younger middle-aged people. We also interestingly ask about political affiliation compared to Democrats and the national average of 22% denying vaccines uh, acceptance. Uh, Republicans most likely to deny a taking a vaccine or accepting, a, refusing a vaccine. And this has been a constant trend throughout the past two years since the pandemic and when the vaccines came out. Uh, then we also asked about people and their likelihood of getting sick of COVID or getting infected. Those who said, I'm definitely not likely to get infected. Possibly those who have higher incomes or work from home, have adequate protection, belief in natural immunity or health, their own health, uh, there were some people who did not believe they'll get COVID and those were the most likely to refuse a vaccine when it would come out, 58% to more than twice the national average. And we see that even now, those who think they are invincible continue to deny a vaccine or not take it. Um, in the final regression model, we put together all the variables to see if they were interrelated. And we found this regression equation predicts that the strongest predictor of vaccine hesitancy before COVID-19 vaccine came out was having a child at home, being lower income and education, being a Republican as affiliating themselves with the Republican party. Perception of not getting infected, or even if they were infected, the, it won't be a serious problem. So your perceived severity of the disease, perceived susceptibility of disease is low. And so you don't want the vaccine. Uh, what we also wrote in this study is that not all the COVID vaccine hesitant people are traditional, conservative, conspiracy theorists, anti-vaxxers. Many people did write in our questionnaire that they're concerned about the speed of development of the vaccine, the side effects, uh, the safety profile, because it was almost like being rushed out and the politics surrounding the vaccine. But still, even today, income and education are playing a role. Political affiliation plays a big role. I checked last night. Uh, April 21, 2022, uh, what are the vaccination rates of American people today? We still have some 30% people in the 18 to 24 age group, some 33% in the 25 to 39. The ones we predicted in June 2020 are still the most hesitant as of April 21, 2022, two years in the making. And these people have the lowest vaccination rate uh, for a dose or for being fully vaccinated. So really the target should be 18 to 49 years of age. If we are to redouble our efforts, this population seems to be a lot more resistant to taking even a single dose of the vaccine. 
which we predicted in our study. And these people, especially if they're rural, uh, lesser education, lesser income, Republicans um, still scared of the side effects, do not believe in the vaccines or are not afraid of getting sick. So in two years, we tracked the US uh, vaccine hesitancy and then we thought of racial minorities. Uh, we had a student here in NMSU and she's from El Paso. She told me we have a lot of people in the community who don't want the vaccine, predominantly Hispanic border area people. Um, and so we thought we would review all the data that's available. So we reviewed all the media reports, all the publications, all the papers that existed on Hispanics and African-Americans. And those, this study is now being used by the CDC and Health and Human Services to lay out rules of non-discrimination, increasing access and equity for certain populations who are at a disadvantage on how to increase vaccine access and uptake for those populations. We found in this study that we had 13 studies, 100,000 participants. The average vaccine hesitancy rate was 26%, but for African-Americans, it was 41%. Uh, for Hispanics, 30%. And the idea was mistrust, lower age, lower income, uh, conspiracy theories were dominating vaccine refusal tendencies in these two populations. Uh, we also checked on people uh, of family influence and sent another questionnaire June 2021. Uh, and from 50 states, we had 1,600 participants. Those who did not have a person die in their household or infected in their household were three to four times more likely to refuse a vaccine. So really your family structure, your neighborhood matters. If you have someone who's sick at home or is hospitalized or died, you're more likely to accept a vaccine, which means you see the firsthand impact of COVID-19 infection. And so this study was June, 2021. After this one, we heard about protests from healthcare workers. So in March, 2021, three months after the vaccines came out, we had nurses on the streets protesting around here nationwide. So we conducted a study, a global review of vaccine hesitancy in healthcare workers. Among 76,000 healthcare workers worldwide, 22% were hesitant. Uh, and their biggest concerns were safety, efficacy, and side effects of the vaccines. Thankfully, those who are males, older, or physicians were most likely to accept COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and it's interesting because we think healthcare workers may know better, but they're a part of the larger population. They're not a monolithic group and worldwide, many of them don't have even have a bachelor's degree. They're maybe frontline assistants, office workers. Uh, and so it shows why healthcare workers are resistant. Based on this study, uh, a lot of media people are now tracking hospital rate, vaccination rates for healthcare workers across the United States. As of today, we don't know how many healthcare workers in the United States are not vaccinated. Um, so, in, you know, in conclusion, I also want to thank some of the students who helped me lead these studies. They were in the media and they took on this global task of reviewing all the data, material, media. And we have been able to publish on nurses' hesitancy, medical students, dentists, and it's almost like 15 to 25 percent dentists, nurses, medical students are still not taking the vaccine. Uh, which tells you about the social influence, the media influence, family influence. You are a healthcare worker, you spend eight hours in the office, but back home, you are still surrounded by the same belief systems that your family has, the society has. So being a healthcare worker may not have much of an impact on health behavior, especially if you know our communication has been weak on how to advocate for vaccines. Um, I do have some global studies going on. We did one in India, one with college students worldwide. And they have almost the same problems. We don't know what the vaccines look like. What are the side effects? We need more info. The government should be transparent. Uh, what happens if I'm sick? Um, and so, you know, in conclusion, I want to uh, write about, uh, discuss the discussion that we put out in all these studies, multiple ones, that we believe in the C strategies. When you can, are trying to go out and educate people or make a policy, think of the context. Who are you dealing with? Remove the constraints of people getting, trying to get a vaccine, mobile clinics, transportation, access to vaccines. Increase people's confidence in vaccination by giving them factual information, the benefits. Improve the calculations in favor of vaccines. Reduce complacency. Uh, many of us are now eligible for the booster, but it's like, oh, I'll get it next time tomorrow. And that should be reduced. Communication is key, and we have failed multiple times at regional and national and global level. Uh, we have failed to 
provoke a sense of collective responsibility. And finally, in some of our studies, we show you don't always have to talk about vaccination, but also infection and what it can do to people. So the, these recommendations are given in all of our studies to promote vaccination. Um, and then thank you um, for allowing me to present and uh, um, I'll wait for the questions uh, when it all ends. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. This is also a fascinating presentation. And again, you'll have a chance to ask questions after our four uh, presenters have presented. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Yetza Bohorquez. Uh, Dr. Bohorquez uh, holds an MD and a PhD degree in epidemiology and a Master of Science in Public Health. Her main research interest is on the social determinants of health in the areas of mental health, health-related practices, and migrant health. From 2010 on, she has been a professor researcher at the Department of Population Studies El Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Mexico, where she's currently in charge of the surveys of migration in Mexico's borders. She is currently working on the development of a model to facilitate access to mental health for migrants and a qualitative study of migrants' access to healthcare, among other projects. The title of her presentation today is Reflections on COVID-19 at the Tijuana-San Diego border. Dr. Bojorquez, the mic is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today and thank you for having me. Uh, what, what I'm going to present is uh, the results of a study we conducted on the prevalence of, uh, of the virus, of SARS-CoV-2 infection in Baja California. It was a population-based survey, but I want to emphasize two or comment on two different things. First, the results of the study itself. And second, the fact that it was a, this was a joint effort by a lot of people and many institutions. So it was a very fine example, I think, of binational collaboration. And uh, as such as one of the many binational collaborations we have at the Mexico-US border and we have had through the years. In this case, this was an effort mostly uh, supported by, by uh, Mexico's consulate in San Diego, but also with a lot of help from UC San Diego and uh, the, the Mexican government in, in Baja California, the Ministry of Health in Baja California, and as uh, academic partners, the University of Baja California and El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, where, where I work. Uh, we conducted this study mainly because we were interested in, in two, two major things. First, first of all, uh, in Mexico, as in other countries, uh, COVID-19 case detection is still and, and was at the time based on sentinel surveillance. So it was not uh, aimed to be a, a, a comprehensive system of, of epidemiological surveillance. And uh, even if it was a sentinel surveillance, it should be inter interpreted as such. Many people was using data from that system as it was reflective of the actual prevalence of, of uh, COVID-19. And we lack at that, at that point population level and representative data, which is required for planning and to understand this is dynamics. And more or less at the same time, there was a national survey going on in Mexico, aimed also to, to understand the, the, uh, the scope of the pandemic in Mexico. But our study was focused in Baja California and the national survey was not going to be representative at the state level. So it was important to have special data at the state level. And why we think Baja California was important for this, besides because uh, the, the obvious reason that we live in Baja California, many of us in the group, was that uh, from March 2020, 2021 on, the land border between the US and Mexico was closed to all non-essential travel. And the reason for that was prevention of, of transmission of the, of the infection. And it, th this uh, land border closure had major social and economic consequences. Probably many of you were aware of that at the time. And there was little evidence, very little evidence, and still there is, on the utility or if this was effective for avoiding disease transmission. So when we were thinking about doing the survey, we were in part trying to address this issue and trying to provide some sense of what was going on with the epidemic in, in each side of the border. We ended up doing this only on the Mexican side. But the, the, the idea was, well, is there really 
such a high risk of transmission between Baja California and California, for example? Or, or what's, the, what's, the, what's the rationale for, for this border closure? No? So that was an, an important issue to address. So the, the main objective of the survey was to estimate the prevalence of current and previous SARS-CoV-2 infection in Baja California. And it was, a, as I said, a household survey, a probability household, household survey. We stratified it by city. It was done only in three cities in Baja California, but the three cities concentrate uh, most of the population of, of the state. And we uh, selected a cluster, uh, which were formed by AHEP, which is like the, uh, similar to census tracts in the US. From each one of those AHEP, we selected blocks, and from the blocks, we selected households, all of them with probability proportional to size. Uh, and from the households, we selected individuals, one individual per household, who was five years old or older. So this was a survey of both uh, minors and adults. Uh, we applied a questionnaire with sociodemographics and especially with transborder mobility questions. So we wanted to learn if, the, especially if there was a higher risk of, of uh, infection among those who were crossing the border frequently. We took blood samples for anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies for measuring them, and also nasal swabs for RT-PCR tests for, the, for current infection. The field work was done in a really short time. It was a very intensive uh, field, field, uh, field work in February 2021. So it was almost at the end of the second wave of COVID in, in Mexico at, at the time, but still it was going on. So it was uh, very difficult for a lot of reasons that you can imagine. And we have the, the help of uh, 155 students from Baja California University who did uh, an amazing job of, of going to each house and trying to convince people that this was an important effort and they should let us pick, pick their fingers and take nasal swabs, which are not very nice to, to experience. And we had the supervision of Baja California's Ministry of Health, which was also very important because the RT-PCRs were, were taken to the state lab, which was, was a, was a validated lab for, for the, the measure of the conduction of RT-PCRs for COVID and other things. So we had an unweighted end of over a thousand participants in the, in the survey. And once uh, we weight the, the estimators, this is the, the distribution, distribution by gender, age, and education. And this only shows that the, the sample was very similar or after expansion, it was very similar to the actual proportion of, of this, uh, these characteristics in the, in the Baja California population. So it was more or less half male, half female. Most people were between 18 and 59 years old. And uh, there, was, there were also a fifth, about a fifth of minors. And the educational level was also similar to the general population in Baja California, which is high by Mexican standards, but it's uh, about the, the median uh, years of studies somewhere in high school. And uh, there was also a, a quarter of the population ha that had some college or more. So these are the main results in terms of, of the prevalence of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So for, for RT-PCR, we had a general prevalence of 7.8%. Um, but as you can see, there, were, there was a big difference between the three cities, uh, which shows that the dynamics of the uh, epidemic at that point was different in each city. Uh, Tijuana and Mexicali had already gone down from their peak in December, January that year. And Ensenada was still in the middle of a, of a very high rate of infection. So 22% was is, is very high. Um, but in general, for the, for the three cities, the, the, the group of the three cities, it was 7.8%. And that, that's for the, like the current infection. But about past infection, which is measured by the IgG positives, the antibody positives, we found a general prevalence of 21% or 21.1%, slightly different by city, but very similar. So let's say about 20%. And uh, there are not many studies that have done this type of, of um, 
sample design for, for COVID-19, most studies have been conducted in, in very specific populations, for example, healthcare workers or older people residences or things like that, spaces or places that like that or small areas. So I think it's important to compare this with other similar studies which aim to be representative at, at the population level of a, a larger population in that sense. So the, the national survey in Mexico, the, uh, which I was telling you about, which was called the Ensanut COVID, um, was conducted from August to November 2020. So it was a, a few months before. And the national survey prevalence they, they found was 20, almost 25%. So it was about a quarter of the population. Um, sorry, I was looking at the chat. Uh, at the same time, for example, or more or less at the same time, in New York City, a, a, a household survey also found a prevalence of about a quarter of the population. And it was similar in some uh, major Bra uh, cities in Brazil in May to June 2020. So it seems like for, for the big urban areas all around the world, or almost all, all around the world, at that point in time, we were about that, that uh, about a fifth to one quarter of the population had been infected. Now it's much higher, of course. So the first conclusion was we had a similar situation as in other, in other places no, around the world. Um, we found that 5.3% had crossed the border in the past six months. The, the border was closed, of course. And only 10% of that 5.3% had anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So it was a really small proportion of those who had crossed, who had, uh, who were positive. This doesn't say anything about where they had catch the virus, but it says that they were not, uh, I mean, th there was not that big population uh, moving the, the, the epidemic across the border around. And this uh, also about the, the preventive measures they had taken in the past six months. Well, most of them had frequently used the mask in public. You know, all, almost three quarters had washed their hands frequently, but only slightly over half had frequently avoided leaving home. So in Mexico, there were uh, only a few people who were able to stay at home, even in, 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 the, in the, the highest peaks of the, of the pandemic. So the, the main conclusions I want to share with you today is one, the seroprevalence of antibodies was similar to the ones reported in urban areas around the world. It was not higher, it was not lower, significantly lower or higher. Uh, border crossers were not more likely to be infected than other members of the, of the population, which, as I say, doesn't tell us anything directly about where they did uh, get infected, but give us a hint that border crossing in this time, in this area, was not a, a, an important uh, mechanism of transmission. Uh, less than half of, of these persons were able to shelter in place. So uh, that, that's an important uh, barrier to, to public health measures. And that binational collaboration is essential in border regions. I think this was an amazing effort by teams from both sides of the border collaborating. And we, are, we still have to uh, reach a lot of, of, of conclusions from this study. And I think that's it. Thank you. Dr. Bohorquez, thanks a million. This is a wonderful presentation, very informative. It gives you a broader perspective of what's going on in the world in relation to COVID. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Ms. Saida Martin. Uh, she's a graduate student seeking her MA in anthropology with a minor in gender and sexuality studies at New Mexico State University, where, she's also, where she also obtained her BA degree majoring in government, Spanish, criminal justice, and gender and sexuality studies. Her research interests include immigration, migration, and gender. So, Saira, the microphone is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Diaz, um, and thank you all for, for joining us. I'm, I would like to begin by thanking um, the Center for Latin American and Border Studies for putting together um, this symposium on a topic that's so important and so timely right now. Um, so my presentation focuses on Title 42 and the impacts um, it has on migrants in the Paso del Norte region and how displacement of migrants has not only been a humanitarian but also a public safety concern um, in the region.
I would like to begin by explaining a little bit about Title 42, um, which we heard of a little bit in the migration plan in the migration panel. Um, but Title 42 is a 1944 public health law that allows for the U.S. government to prohibit, um, in part or in whole, the entry of people from foreign countries due to um, to prevent the spread of a communicable disease. In March of 2020. Um, in the early days of COVID-19, the Trump administration called for the director of disease of the Center for Disease Control um, and Prevention to invoke Title 42, um, temporarily restricting the entry of people from, from foreign countries. Um, using COVID-19 as a pretext, the Trump administration interpreted Title 42 to mean that the Department of Homeland Security, including Customs and Border Protection and Border Patrol could expel irregular migrants um, as quickly as possible without even granting threatened migrants um, the right to seek asylum. Um, this order directly defied national and international legal protections for asylum seekers at the U.S. border as it suspended um, all rights for asylum seekers to, to present their claims um, to the U.S. government and just put them out for immediate expulsion. Um, it is worth noting that at the time that this code was reenacted, COVID-19 rates were higher in the United States than in any other country in the Americas. Um, this was at the time of the first um, wave of COVID in European countries. Um, but in terms of the Americas, the U.S. was leading um, with COVID transmissions. Um, additionally, during this time, um, other travelers like students and essential workers like truck drivers were allowed to um, enter the country without having to provide a negative COVID test. Um, and with all this being said, the, the Trump administration and the CDC still signaled asylum seekers um, to, risk a, to risk public health safety um, as it was believed that they would increase the, the spread of COVID. Um, as mentioned, this code was reenacted by, by the Trump administration, but the Biden administration has continued with the expulsions of migrants under, uh, under Title 42. Um, the only difference, I think, is that it, the, the Biden administration refused to expel unaccompanied minors. Um, so according to a recent report by the Migration Policy Institute, as of March of 2022, um, since the reenactment of Title 42, over 1.7 million people have been expelled from the United States um, to other countries. Approximately 1.2 million of these people have been um, expelled under the Biden administration. Um, in terms of apprehensions, 60% of all migrants encountered um, at the U.S.-Mexico border were removed um, under Title 42 since March of 2020. Um, this includes 78% of single adults, 28% um, of family units, and 7% of unaccompanied minors. Um, for the most part, Me Mexico has accepted um, the re the expulsions of Mexican citizens, along with citizens from Central American countries like El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. However, migrants from other countries like Haiti, Colombia, and Brazil primarily um, have been expelled by air to their home country. Um, and it is worth noting that for many of um, these migrants, especially um, Haitian migrants, they have not resided in their home country for many years um, prior to being expelled. Although it is unclear on the exact numbers of people sent back to Mexico under Title 42, again, because um, it's just very rapid, they're, they're not really processed. Um, the International Rescue Committee estimates that approximately 700,000 of the one point um, seven million people expelled have been sent to Mexico um, in the years 2020 and 2021. This number may reflect some of um, the people who were returned to Mexico under the migrant protection protocols as these two policies or codes um, coexisted in part of these years. Um, so really the lines are a little blurred in terms of what, po of, in terms of what policy people were returned under. Um, it is estimated that around 60,000 people are currently waiting in Northern Mexican cities 
um, for Title 42 to be rolled back. Um, out of these 10 to, 10 to 12,500 people are estimated to be waiting in Ciudad Juarez alone. Um, the estimated number of people waiting in Ciudad Juarez under Title 42 is estimated based on the number of people in migrant shelters and community centers in Juarez. Um, currently in Ciudad Juarez, are, the shelters are at about 80% capacity. That's approximately 3,000 people. But for every migrant that goes to a shelter or to a community center for assistance, it is estimated that three to four um, people do not. So with the 3,000 people currently in shelters, we can estimate that roughly between 10,000 to 12,000 people um, are in what is out, in and outside of shelters. Um, so there are currently approximately 20 migrant shelters and community centers housing migrants in Ciudad Juarez. Um, together, these hold a capacity for approximately 3,500 people. Um, I didn't realize my map was so tiny, but um, the map to the right of this screen is um, a map of the, of the 16, I believe, main shelters in Ciudad Juarez, and this was compiled by um, El Colegio de la Frontera Norte. And it just kind of, as I mentioned, it highlights the, the main shelters in Ciudad Juarez. And as you can see, most of them are towards the center of the city and very close to, to the border. And I think they're st strategically placed there um, because of, of the, the people who go to these shelters. Um, as I mentioned, shelters are currently at about 80% capacity, but throughout most of the pandemic, um, many of the shelters were full, if not exceeding capacity, and people were still arriving daily. Um, in the height of, of the pandemic, um, there was about 200 to 300 people arriving daily um, to shelters, and they were being spread out across um, this, net, this network of shelters. Um, again, not everyone would go to one of these shelters or community centers. Um, throughout this time, we also see the we also saw the starting of tent cities throughout the border, particularly across international ports of entry. Um, in shelters, like in these makeshift tent cities, there was overcrowding and and many concerns for people's um, safety and physical well-being. Mm -hmm. Needless to say. Um, Shelters have been stretched very thinly um, with the increased number of people coming through, the lack of resources and increasing COVID-19 numbers. Um, the shelters and community centers were, were mainly concerned with the transmission of COVID in these overcrowded places, um, which led them to, to implement um, some shelters to be designated for migrants who tested positive um, to COVID exclusively. Um, one of the locations that was um, designated for migrants who tested positive was uh, Centro Integrador Leona um, Vicario. Uh, this was implemented by the federal government due to the number of displaced individuals in the city um, due to Title 42 and MPP. Um, Esperanza para Todos was one of the smaller shelters, which although they had very limited spaces and resources um, was accepting COVID, COVID positive um, migrants. Um, additionally, the Office of International Migration and other immigrant advocacy groups offered accommodations at um, a local hotel, Hotel Filtro, for migrants who tested positive um, to quarantine for up to two weeks before seeking hospitality in one of the other shelters in the city. In terms of COVID-19 um, transmissions among migrants, again, the numbers are a bit unclear. Um, there is not yet data that reflects the total number of migrants um, infected by COVID-19. However, data from the International Office of Migration shows that approximately 6% of migrants expelled to Ciudad Juarez had confirmed cases of COVID-19 at the time of arrival to the city. Um, however, it is worth noting that approximately 30% um, of migrants arrived to Ciudad Juarez with symptoms of COVID after being in U.S. immigration custody. Um, again, this, this can be due in part um, to the very crowded conditions um, in, well, that they had in immigration custody. 
um, as mentioned, although the shelters took precautions to minimize the, the number of transmissions and um, the implementation of COVID shelter certainly helped. The shelters were stretched very thin um, as there were an unprecedented amount of long-term migrants basically stuck um, in the city because of Title 42 and because of MPP before that. Um, so Title 42 in, in conjunction with, with the pandemic has contributed to the already overwhelmed system of shelters in Ciudad Juarez and the overall um, healthcare system and public health concerns have contributed to public health concerns in the city. Um, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration insisted that Title 42 is a public health policy and not an immigration policy. However, it has impacted migration and subsequently public health, um, particularly in Mexican border cities such as Ciudad Juarez. Um, and just to conclude, um, the end of Title 42, which is scheduled to um, for May 23rd of this year, um, will undoubtedly bring new challenges to border cities along the U.S. Mexico along the U.S. Mexico border. I think on on both sides of of the border, um, there is a lot of pushback on ending uh, Title 42. But a recent report by the Department of Homeland Security um, states that they're preparing for an unprecedented number of people at the US-Mexico border. Um, they are anticipating up to 18,000 people per day and up to 500,000 people um, per month. Um, it is still quite unclear if the Department of Homeland Security has a plan or a strategy to process this large amount of people, um, not only rapidly given the amount of time that they have been waiting in Mexico, but in a human, in a, 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 in a humanely way as well. Um, again, this will undoubtedly have impacts on both sides of the border. Um, and based on, previ on previous events of large numbers of people at the US-Mexico border, I presume that it will, it will lead to further militarization in the border region. Um, again, impacting cities on, on both sides. Um, just briefly to conclude, I, I anticipate that the lasting effects of Title 42 um, are going to be an emerging and very interesting area of research, and I look forward to engaging in it in the future. Um, and with this, I, I conclude so I can leave some, some time for any questions um, to any of us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have had four excellent presentations today. And now we have about 15 minutes uh, for participants in this event to ask questions of any of our presenters. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand, go to the icons on, on the bottom of your screen and raise your hand and we'll give you a chance to speak. Uh, do we have a question from anybody to any, for any of our presenters? Okay, Ietza, uh, Dr. Bojorquez, you have a question? Yeah, can, can, can we have questions between ourselves too? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's because uh, Syrah's work really resonates with me because I have been doing work with, with migrants in shelters too. So I wanted to share with you that at, at more or less the same time we were doing the, the population survey in Baja California, we were also doing a survey in shelters in Tijuana. And we just published the results and we found a 53% prevalence, zero prevalence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So at almost the same time, the general population in Baja California had 20 something, 21 or 20, close to 21. And the, the population in the shelters had 50 something. So it shows how really migrants had, have been at risk of infection. And this is just one more example of how they are uh, at risk of, of many different types of, of uh, health issues. And at the same time, it has also to do with the conditions in which they were made to wait in the southern side of the border, in the shelters, as you were describing, Saira. So I, I found very interesting your, your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Do we have any other comments or questions in relation to any of our four presentations today? Uh, please raise your hand with using the icon at the bottom of your screen. Your screen, and, and and yes, presenters can ask questions of other presenters also. Thank 
I guess I can ask a question. Yes, yes, please. Also, Zaira, um, what do you think about uh, Governor Abbott's recent strategies to take migrants who are coming into the U.S. and taking them to Washington, D.C.? And what's going to happen with this influx? I imagine a lot of it's going to be in El Paso. And so I'm just curious, like, what your thoughts are on that? Absolutely. Um, thank you for your question. Um, like I like I mentioned, based on on previous, um, I'll answer the second part of your question first. Um, based on on previous times that we've seen um, large numbers of people at our border, um, I am anticipating or I presume that we will be in a situation similar to the one that we were in 2019, in which. Um, CBP and Border Patrol were just, um, you know, like releasing people um, onto like Greyhound stations and gas stations. And I think it will really be up to the community um, that, that includes um, religious organizations and nonprofits around the community to, to coordinate travel, to, to coordinate arrangements um, for people to make it to their destination. Um, in terms of, of your first the first part of your question, it, it really took me by surprise that, um, well, not really, that Governor Abbott um, decided to to go with that route. Um, I, I do see how it was a, a political move that he was using people as, as pawns to make a political statement. Um, but by reading some of the, the interviews that some of the volunteers gave, um, they were quite grateful to, to have a, a comfortable ride to Washington DC um, to have, you know, like to be closer to, to their destination. Um, I do anticipate Texas and, you know, other states um, playing some of, some of the same games using people as political pawns, but I really do think, um, and I hope that community organizations um, step up to, to take care of the crisis that, is, that, we are gonna, that we're gonna face in the border. Um, but thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, and there is a question here for Jagdish from David Ortiz. It's in the chat. And, and I can ask it directly uh, for, for Dr. Kubanchani. Um, my, my question is basically, can you expand a little more on the actual recommendations that you had, uh, the strategies, right? And if you could recommend one or two things that we could all do to try to, to curb the vaccine hesitancy, 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 sorry, hesitancy, it's hard, uh, that, that we're experiencing and it's growing, right? So that, that is what's, what's really scary. So the growth of this vaccine hesitancy, how do we curb it? How do we, help. So you had several strategies. I would, I wish maybe you could tell us what's the main one or what's the easiest one for a lot of us to try to, to help with this. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I had uh, a bunch of C's here. Maybe I can pull them up again. Um, I think at the heart of it, uh, if we have to look at the foundation of where it comes from is this one, communication. Um, so, when I went to get my vaccines and boosters, there's a pharmacist or a nurse giving the vaccine and you ask questions, they don't have answers. Um, that's just one example. Then we have Pfizer put out the first vaccine, 48,000 people in the trial, but that info that's in the depth of their trial results, how many were pregnant, how many were not, I think that inf information for the public was missing. Uh, many of the women in our studies had concerns about fertility. All the studies that show that getting vaccinated actually reduces your risk of dying of COVID and does not cause more stillbirths or abortions. Uh, you know, those kinds of information pieces have to be communicated better. And healthcare providers have a major role in advocating for the vaccines or communicating better. Um, then there's issues with, you know, again, within communication, increasing people's confidence. Uh, for lay people who are not from the health background, you know, you have to show them all the benefits, persistent communication, build their confidence, be able to address their concerns, 
And that's what, what not we do. I think we end up labeling people as a lefter, writer, conspiracy theorist, anti-vaxxer. And, and that's just been, uh, you know, one of the issues. So globally, I think uh, communication across various sectors, regionally, nationally, has to improve. And that would increase the uptake of vaccines. Uh, and all the strategies that we have discussed, communication remains the key. Um, so that would be one of my favorite picks is communication. I have a question for Dr. Bohorquez. Uh, I wonder if there are any studies that have been done on vaccination hesitancy in Mexico. Do you anticipate, uh, do you think that the factors there would be similar to the factors in the US or would it be different in Mexico? I think some of them will be, for example, educational level and uh, ethnicity, I think it will work different, but we just also conducted a study in the Mexico-Guatemala border and some of the questions were, were about vaccination hesitancy. And we found uh, like a 25% of hesitancy. So uh, almost half of the people we interviewed had already been vaccinated. A quarter was willing to be vaccinated in the future and another quarter was unwilling to be vaccinated. And the main reasons they, uh, the, the main variables associated with it were uh, education on the one hand and on the other religion. But I think religion can have very different impacts in different zones. Uh, a, a colleague of mine who is an expert of religion says it has a lot to do who, who is your religious leader, like a pastor in some churches or the padre in other kinds of religions. So I think it's very, I don't know, location specific, some variables, but education for sure is one of those. And the other one was uh, who, who, which was their most trusted source of information for, for about vaccines. So lack of trust in the government, of course, was related to uh, unwillingness to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you very much for sharing that information. Do we have any, que any more questions for our presenters today? Uh, let me see, the questions and answers, somebody has a question here. Uh, Daniel Aguilar is asking, how does digital media and social media affect and effect vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Jagdish? Yeah, I think we discussed this in our global studies of you know, disadvantaged populations. Younger racial minorities with less than a bachelor's degree are the most heavily influenced. And again, the challenge is, you know, they, for them, it's easier to find info on social media than to be asking a healthcare worker, professional, who do not do a good job of, you know, explaining stuff. I mean, if you take a national random sample of physicians in the United States, and how likely are they to know about the exact mechanism of, of how these vaccines work and function, what are their effects, uh, they, would, they would not be able to do a good job. And so that's why social media dominates the narrative today. And, you know, we have to have more community-based resources to help people get knowledge and awareness about vaccines. Wonderful. Yeah, and just to add, I think the WHO has mentioned that we have a pandemic and on top of that, we have the infodemic and uh, they're suggesting that tech companies should also now take, in, take some control of these narratives. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions or comments about our, uh, for our presenters? Okay, but well, it seems like there are no more questions or comments. I wanna thank all of you for your participation and thank you to our four presenters for four excellent presentations. And I want to commend Saira. I see a lot of uh, research potential there. I think that Dr. Palacio, Dr. Kutch and Danny may wanna hire Saira for something <laughs> or maybe Aiza too. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It, this has been a wonderful symposium. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.